In the summer of 1961, life in Dundalk, a working class suburb of Baltimore, was fun and carefree for a six-year-old like me. My little brother Barry and I got to play with our friends in a large backyard that bordered a creek every day. There were cool swings and forts, and sometimes we got a chance to follow the creek to its headwaters to a large spooky cemetery on the hill a mile away. Wow, what an adventure. The kids in the neighborhood roamed woo, woo, like a loud, noisy pack of dogs until my dad bellowed in his sergeant voice, Matthew, Barry, dinner. Home was a two bedroom pink, now it's white, house on Willow Road with a huge backyard and a basement to play in. It was a 1960s Norman Rockwell life. For me, the biggest event of the summer was the Fort Hollowbird picnic. My father was a sergeant in the army, so our family was invited to my dad's base for a day of free food, games, and prizes. It was, the near, it was a yearly grand meeting of the army brats. There were rows of grills with hot dogs and hamburgers. Mmm, I could smell the burning meat. I was returning with my mom to defend our three-legged race title. My mom was packing the car. She was taking forever. And I was displaying my best six-year-old patience. After the ninth or tenth, are we going? Dad gave me a get out of my hair so we can get done look. I wandered around the house looking for something to occupy myself. I settled on the kitchen for entertainment. My mom had a new stove with a self-lighting range. I start, she used to have to light it with a match. I started to turn the burner on and off. The ticking sound was cool, and the whoosh of the flame was mesmerizing. <laughs> I heard my mom call, Matthew Mark. The inserting of my middle name meant she meant business. So I stopped my stove plate and ran to the car. The picnic was better than ever. We defended our three-legged race and won a whole watermelon, my favorite summer food. I was busy hydrating with, some, with a bottle of free Coke when I saw my dad talking to some military police. That wasn't unusual. Dad's army assignment involved talking to the MPs all the time. This time it was different. Dad ran up to mom had a very short conversation, and headed for our car. Mom came for us. Time to go. But mom, get in the car, now. Mom never yelled at us. I was scared and angry at the same time. Man, I didn't even get to go to the dessert table. We climbed into the car, and my dad sped away, the parking lot gravel flying. The MP's car led the way with lights flashing. This made me really excited, except for my mom and dad's silence, which made me worry. We arrived at the neighborhood. I could smell smoke. Oh no. As we got nearer, I saw three fire trucks, several police cars, and dozens of neighbors around our burning house. A, a burning house. I was panicked. My heart pounded. I, I could hardly breathe. Mom told me to stay away from that stove. Did I burn down the house? All I could do was watch my, the firemen work and talk to the neighbors. Dad went to talk to the fire captain. Mom was squeezing my brothers in my hand until it started to hurt. Dad came up quickly, looking my brother and I straight in the face. Were you boys playing in the kitchen? Fear ran through me like an electric shock. We both shook our heads, no. But I knew why he asked about the kitchen. It, it was me. I burned down the house. Man, this was bad. What were mom and dad going to do? Mom was always telling anyone who would listen that I was the perfect child. Except that one time when I sat down in the snow and I wouldn't budge. It was because I missed my dad. Dad always called me his number one son. My parents never hit us. Instead, they talked to us about how disappointed they were and how they expected better. It was all about honor. I think I would have preferred a spanking. <laughs> At the time, I was glad Dad asked. Mom would have known for sure that I was lying. She had a mystical mom ability to see through my lies. 
We stayed with the neighbors that night. I didn't sleep. I dreamed of the house burning over and over. I never lied or kept secrets from my parents, so I felt physically uncomfortable and spent half the night in the bathroom. There were so many times over the next few days that I almost burst out, burst out. yes, I was in the kitchen, yes, I was playing with the stove, and yes, I burned down the house. For the next 10 days, my parents were busy cleaning the pink house. My brother Barry and I played in the yard trying to stay out of the way. The only, only the kitchen was damaged, but the whole house reeked of smoke. You could smell it from across the street where we were staying, a constant reminder of my part in the fire. Our landlord told my parents that we had to move, so at the end of the month, my parents rented the house across the street. Every day I went out the front door, I relived what I had done. <laughs> Look what you did, I thought. You're a liar. You burnt down the house. Summer ended. School began. They repaired the pink house, and some old folks moved in. At Sunday school, there would be Bible stories about honesty or being a good son or, or sin in general. I swear the teacher was only looking at me. The teacher never came out and said anything about hell, but the kids talked in whispers about going to hell if you were bad. They used the word hell to taunt others, or maybe just to say a bad word. It did get me thinking, was there really a hell? Was I going there because I lied to my parents about causing the fire? When I was 10, I started going to church with my parents. One of the pastors was famous for his fire and brimstone sermons. Upon the wicked, he will rain fire and brimstone. I know what fire is, but what the heck is brimstone? <laughs> it doesn't sound good. I squirmed in my pew. He spoke about how sinners go to hell. I mulled this around in my 10-year-old brain. Hmm, I sinned, so that means I'm going to hell. I knew it. I'm going to hell. I forgot all about the Jesus and being saved and forgiveness thing. It was as if, as if he wrote the sermon for me. After services, I couldn't look him in the eye during fellowship time. I just tucked the guilt deep inside where all the going to hell secrets hide. As the years passed, I grew up. The memory of that day faded, but from time to time, something would trigger feelings of guilt. It usually happened when my parents were praising me about being such a good son. <laughs> if only you knew. The guilt was like a virus. It would lay dormant, waiting for the perfect conditions to activate the feelings from that day so long ago. Eventually, I became a teacher, and I confronted many children about lying. As I sat face to face with one of my six-year-old students, they would wiggle and avoid eye contact. I, I think to myself, my friend, I've been in your shoes. Come clean. It'll save you a lot of money and therapy bills later on. <laughs> then I let him off with my mom's speech about being disappointed and expecting more from them. Many years later, my, my father died. My mom moved into assisted living, and I helped her move, move into the new apartment. When we finished, she made us some tea, began gushing praise on me again. Oh, Matt, you're so helpful. What a big, strong man you've been. I always can count on you for doing the right thing. That was enough for me. My guilt had reached the tipping point. I couldn't hold it in anymore. Uh, uh, Mom, um, I burnt down the pink house. What? The one in Baltimore? Yeah, I was playing with the stove before the picnic. I felt like I had lost a 100-pound weight that I had been dragging around to say it out loud. And an emotional knot untied inside of me. Mom began to smile. 
So you've been holding this in since you were six? I nodded, relief poured out of me. Well, hon, that fire started behind the stove. It was bad wiring. She said it matter-of-factly. <laughs> what? What are you saying? It's not me? I felt oddly disappointed. <laughs> then mom asked, would you like a cookie with your tea, dear? I closed my eyes and looked down like I was praying. I replayed all the times that I wanted to fess up to my crime. I lived with these feelings of guilt for so long that they were a part of me. I opened my eyes and looked up at mom. The little kid inside of me surfaced. Do you think I'm going to hell for this? I took a sip of tea and waited for some wisdom. Well, I hope not, dear. <laughs> And then she added, God forgives you, and I forgive you too. I wanted to say, that was it? Bad wiring? Good God, Mom, I've been suffering for 50 years, 50 damn years, and you and God forgive me? Is that all you got to say? On the drive home, it dawned on me, I don't have to worry about hell. I've already experienced it. <laughs> when I kept that pink house secret inside me all those years, at least I have a mom who forgives me. I guess that makes me one lucky sinner. That's Matthew Christian Sure. Give it up. <laughs>